Hi all. In this module, we will see about the DNA barcoding, how the uh, technique can be applied for, you know, the species delimitation as well as to identify an unknown species. So first, we will start the discussion with the primer design, sequencing and contact assembly in this brief video. So as you know, everything starts with extraction. The DNA has to be extracted, which is of extremely high purity, isn't it? So always fresh samples are preferred, for example, fresh tissue sample. If you're working with plants, uh, uh, you know, the leaf samples are perfectly fine. If fresh materials are not available, uh, you can uh, use a frozen material, a fresh frozen material. So freshly collected material, uh, put it in the minus 80, you know, uh, or you know, even frozen material is not available, then you can try with the dry material. Even the herbarium vouchers of hundreds of years old have been proved to be useful. But if you're working with the formalin preserved sample, uh, most probably it might not yield any amplifiable DNA because formalin do disintegrate the DNA molecule. So uh, preserving in the formalin is not a viable option if you really want to amplify the DNA at a later stage, you know. But uh, fresh or frozen or even dry, dry specimen in a normal herbarium voucher that is a pressed voucher and herbarium sheet is absolutely fine. Uh, but if you still want to increase the yield, I suggest you to dry it in a silica gel that works perfectly fine. And if you're working with leaves, always prefer tender leaves, you know, because uh, it is an uh, active uh, cell multiplication state. So the DNA molecule, the, uh, the quantity is quite high. So it's much better than old age, you know, aged leaf materials. So you can grind it in liquid nitrogen or silica. That could be the initial step, you know, the, the grinding in the DNA extraction buffer. So make sure that there won't be any vigorous shaking or vortexing at any steps to avoid shearing. The DNA shearing means, uh, you know, the breaking, physical breaking of the damaging done on the DNA molecule. So to avoid that, it's always better to avoid the shaking or vortexing. And uh, the method of DNA extraction depends upon your budget as well as your personal likings, you know, uh, as well as uh, the success. Sometimes the kits doesn't work, the manual CTAP or SDS based methods might work. So SDS or CTAP methods are manual and it's a lot more cheaper comparing with the kits based methods. So uh, these days, mostly everywhere, the so kits are uh, often time used because it's much more easier to standardize and it's much more faster to get the results done So there are so many commercially available kits. You may explore other options for the extraction of the DNA So loci is a plural or locus is a singular that means a genomic region that is used to amplify and uh, for the barcoding purpose You see so gold standard loci prescribed by barcode of life So this is a, a, an international project barcode of life which aims to barcode each and every species on earth, you know, and another such project is called tree of life web project. So this is for uh, making a website with complete, uh, you know, the biodiversity, all organisms uh, representing the planet earth. So the gold standard loci or locus is COX-1. COX-1 is nothing but cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1. So which is uh, most often used barcode for animals as well as certain groups of plants like red algae. So standard barcode for plants is RBCL and MATK. RBCL is large subunit of Rubisco spacer region and MATK is an enzyme coding for maturase K. So as you see, which locus to choose? For example, if I have RBC and MATK, which one should I choose? Or ITS is yet another one. So you, the, the choosing is not random, you know, or just because somebody else choose ITS, let me also choose ITS. So that is not, there should be a proper rationale for choosing a one locus over another locus. And I suggest you, if you're writing a paper, you should write why you choose that locus instead of the other competent lo locus, you know. So that rationale should be based, one of the major uh, uh, concept is the you know uh, it is called hair and tortoise or tortoise and hair approach so that approach is that slow evolving regions you know uh, which are extremely slow like especially the functional genes are evolving much more slower rate like uh, you know the rbcl that is a gene uh, 
these are used for higher taxonomic level or supra specific taxonomic level supra specific means above the species level like uh, the genus level or class level or order level or you know those kind of higher level the slow evolving is much more preferable while fast evolving is for the lower level like infra specific or intra specific that means within the species you know if you are doing a phylogeography that means uh, dispersion patterns of one species over a large uh, geographical area so in that such of uh, in that kind of research it's always better to go with you know fast evolving regions like tr and lf spacer or intergenic spacers or you can even go for its sequences which are evolving much more faster rate so this is what you call that uh, tortoise and hare method so tortoise is slow evolving while hare is fast evolving so that rationale should be justified so how do you design the primer so you know the primer could be species or genus or higher taxonomic hierarchy specific it can be designed by a free tool called primer blast which is completely free offered by ncbi so why do you have to design a specific primer one of the main reason is to avoid the contamination because you are extracting the stuff you know uh, you are getting the environmental DNA right environmental organism for example you are going to Himalayas to collect a, a, a species of moss you will never know that what kind of organisms exist on the top of that moss for example there could be fungi growing on it or bacteria so if you use a, a generic universal barcode like ITS when you extract the DNA so the DNA contains not only the most DNA but also the epiphytes like fungi DNA and if you amplify with the generic uh, universal primer like ITS even the gene uh, of uh, that is a genome or DNA of the fungi gets amplified and that gets a lot of noise when you sequence it so that is not preferable so it's always better if you suspect a cross contamination with epiphytes or endophytes it's always better to go with the species specific primer but if you are working with uni algal culture or uni uh, you know uh, the cultured material for example bacteria you are maintaining pure culture then of course you really don't have to go for uh, this kind of design primer which is species specific because you don't suspect any contamination in that dna sample right so for primer design i suggest this tool primer blast uh, which is uh, very good if you are planning for species or genus or higher taxonomic hierarchy specific so first step is to get the accession number of the desired template dna you know and then enter that accession inside the primer blast and then choose the taxonomic id of specific taxonomic hierarchy under specificity checking parameters so let us attempt to do a higher hierarchy specific primer for this species uh, this is Fisco Mitrella patens, which is a Himalayan moss, right? So that moss looks like this. So this species grows in Himalaya. So we really don't have which primer because nobody has worked on this primer before, uh, you know, our own group. So in that kind of situation, you are starting with tabula rasa, you know, the, the blank slate. So you really have no clue which primer to use. So either you can go with uh, already known primers like ITS, but if you suspect some cross contamination, it's always better to design a primer, right? So for that, first step is to go to the GenBank. Let us go to GenBank by searching in the Google GenBank Gen and click the first click, the first uh, the result, right? So we are right now in the GenBank. So all I have to do is to enter Fisco Mitrella and ITS1. So we want to get the ITS1 sequence of the Fisco Mitrella patents. So right now we have got several hits of this ITS sequences from this species from elsewhere in the world, right? So we already have got this ITS sequence. So uh, of course I can read more and I can see that what uh, primers that the authors used to get this ITS1 and 2. Oh, they might have used universal primers so but I want uh, a species specific primer for that first thing I have to do is to look the accession number so x 98013.1 this is my accession number which I just have to copy I click copy next up is to go to the primer blast so again I can google it primer blast click the first link all right so in this one there are several controls available right so in this one first is to enter the accession number so i can just enter my accession number here this is the accession number of uh, you know that uh, its one sequence of fisco mitrella patents 
so and then all these are finer controls i suggest not to change any of these default delimiter but if you really want to control it later for example if you want to put the span of the exon and intron uh, selection uh, with the rough seq mrna you can do that as well here and in inclusion of the intron or intron lung or primer where all these are you know uh, different controls right and again the melting temperature if you want minimum and maximum with optimality criterion for example if you work with gradient pcr you would need to change the minimum optimum and maximum with the tm difference all these parameters can be used while working with the gradient pcr so right now let us disregard these stops so we this parameter is extremely important so here you can see that primer pair specificity checking parameter so we are going to do the search mode is of course is automatic is okay database is rough seek rough seek is a curated database which is non redundant absolutely fine now which one this is very important which specificity is it homo sapiens that is human being no that is not what we want we want uh, it to be specific only to the most uh, rationale is that i don't want the epiphytic bacteria or plants or fungi uh, to be amplified see so we need to make it this specificity to be mosses so i can simply type mosses and then it will show you exactly so the taxonomic id is gone shown so this is what our taxonomic id for the moss so uh, then we just have to choose the get primers click on this link so as you can see this is a template dna so the template dna is the length is around 1.4 k that is 1.4 kilo uh, that is uh, you know 1400 base pairs so now here of this entire primer you can see several of the forward and reverse primer so here you can see one arrow on towards on the right and towards on the left so this means that this will bind from here to here so this section of the genome or the gene will be amplified by using this primer sets that means primer one and primer two so always there will be two primers for every pcr so forward primer and the reverse primer so here is another primer pair primer pair forward and reverse so if you see that to amplify the entire region uh, you know it looks like it's not possible because you need a lot of contiguous sequences you know a lot of overlap so one of the viable option would be uh, this one the primer two and uh, this the primer pair two i can use then I can also use primer pair 8, then primer pair 9 I can use or I can use primer pair 7 also. So up to here I can amplify with just 3 primer pairs. So to get this one up to here, you know, looks like the, the overlap is so very less here. So I won't really go with this primer uh, to amplify up to this region. You know so maybe i will refine this search and i will use some generic primers as well you know or i will explore further options so this is how to use a species specific primer by primer blast so next step is of course amplification with the primers at hand so amplification is by pcr or polymerase chain reaction you see it's an exponential reaction if you have very less minute quantity of the template dna no problem the pcr is being an exponentially increasing reaction you will get millions even billions and trillions of uh, molecules within you know just a one hour time you know 40 minutes or 50 minutes or 40 cycles of the you know each cycle is basically getting exponentially increasing so you are going to get a sigmoidal graph right so extremely high fidelity reaction that is what this pcr is all about for which we are using an enzyme called tac polymerase uh, that is derived from thermus aquaticus which is a bacterium you know hyperthermophilic bacteria so it is a uh, polymerase enzyme that is dna polymerase because it binds with dna molecule and constructs this daughter dna molecule from uh, you know dntp molecule deoxy uh, you know nucleotide triphosphate molecule so uh, this one for pcr you would need forward primer reverse primer tac pole then dntp mix then water buffer then of course template dna so the template dna the daughter dna is actually being produced by a specific primer so the primer is extremely important that defines which region of the template reach uh, dna to be amplified you know
So after the amplification is now done, next step is the PCR cleanup. So we will have to clean unincorporated DNTPs plus unincorporated primer. Excess primer needs to be removed, so as excess DNTPs needs to be removed. For which of course there are several protocols available. One of the uh, most widely used protocol is something called Exosap IT, which is a trademark of the USB corporation or the Thermo Fisher right now. So Exosap is a combination of two enzymes. One is Exonuclease 1 that cuts you know 5 dash to 3 dash or 5 prime to 3 prime of the, uh, the DNA molecule. It just cuts the single strand DNA molecule. Then it is shrimp alkaline phosphatase that is SAP. So basically it cleaves all the unincorporated primers and excess DNPs right excess primer excess DNPs so the protocol is very simple you just have to put in uh, the required quantity of the exosap IT into the reaction mix then uh, just incubate for 37 points 37 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes followed by 80 degree for another 15 minutes so 37 for 15 minutes is for the treatment while 80 degree for 15 minutes is to inactivate it at the end you are going to get pure PCR product without any uh, excess primer. So all this will be degraded into the nucleosides and inorganic phosphate which won't cause any noise in our further reactions like DNA sequencing. Next is of course sequencing reaction in which uh, we are it's something like a PCR you know it's exactly like PCR but here there are two major differences in PCR we are going to use two primers at one go right each reaction will have two primers forward and reverse but in sequencing reaction you are going to use just either of these either forward or reverse of course you need both you know but you would need two reaction instead of just one enter mixed you know. So DNTPs are also mixed, second uh, important thing is that it's also mixed with fluorescently labeled DDNTPs. DNTPs is deoxynucleotide triphosphate but DDNTPs is dideoxynucleotide triphosphate. Rationale is that whenever this DDNTP is incorporated the chain gets terminated that means it can no longer grow you know in the PCR of course the chain has to grow with tag polymerase right but here whenever this DDNTP gets incorporated it the chain doesn't go grow so chain gets stagnated you know so that is why it is all probability so uh, randomly the chains get terminated different different lengths so so that way you can actually read you know the sequence from one uh, three dash prime three prime to five prime so it is basically separately the sequencing reaction you will have to do separately for both forward as well as reverse primer never uh, uh, together. So it is basically the, each reaction is unidirectional either forward or the reverse that that is what you call the DNA sequencing reaction or sequencing PCR you know so it is basically uh, through the dideoxy chain termination reaction. So chain gets terminated by this. So of course it's a Sanger sequencing that is what it called the Sanger sequencing. So next uh, next up is sequencing cleanup. So we'll have to clean up the uh, extra uh, you know. So next up is very crucial that is sequencing cleanup especially unincorporated fluorescently labeled DD and TPs needs to be inactivated right for which one uh, simple solution is ethanol precipitation which is actually a uh, cost efficient method but it's not that standardized so much better option is Centricep or many companies these days produce spin columns for uh, sequencing cleanup all you have to do is to pipette uh, the, the required sample onto the spin column and spin it that is centrifuge it and take out the sample and which is ready for uh, the gel electrophoresis or capillary gel electrophoresis or sequencing you see so final step is to do in sequencer that is nothing but a capillary gel electrophoresis so it is something like a, a swimming pool in which swimmers of various sizes wearing caps of any four colors you see so this is the, the four colors so four colors represent four different uh, nucleotides you see and now this one the the thin guys will be swimming much faster than fat chaps because the fat of course it's heavier it takes a long time to reach from uh, one electrode to the another electrode as you see it's always the, the dna molecules are deoxyribonucleic acids right acids so it's negatively charged it goes towards a positively charged electrode and uh, it is basically uh, proportional to the size and that is why the smallest first then comes uh, progressively larger that is why you can actually read the sequence backward 
you see so and here when it reaches near the positive electrode there is a laser beam and a sensor so it produce uh, this kind of intensity versus time electrophorogram so this graphical representation of the sequence is known as electrophorogram so electrophorograms like this is the final output of any dna sequencing reaction either you do it yourself or if you send the sequencing for uh, outsourcing companies they will send you these electrophorograms and these electrophorograms are ready for further analysis you know uh, for example uh, multiple sequence alignment or blast or phylogeny so all you will do with this kind of uh, electrophorograms next step is very crucial that is called base calling so base calling is nothing but assigning bases to the chromatogram peaks so all you're going to get is so you will have different peaks you see the colored peaks on the chromatogram so you will have to assign specific base on it of course it proportional to the the color you know that most of these uh, base calls or electrophorograms are color coded so all you have to do is to look at the color and then assign the proper base onto that position so one of the popular program is known as fred base calling so these base calls need to be carefully checked or audited at a later stage so don't trust overly on this base call automatic base call you would need to manually edit that i will explain that in uh, later in this module so next up is something called quantic assembly or also known as genome walking or shotgun sequencing it is nothing but assembly of the the unidirectional reads you see as i told you sequencing is always done with either or either forward or reverse primer so each primer pair you are going to have two sequences one with the forward primer another with the reverse primer so you would need uh, to assemble these sequences at the overlapping site so that is what the quantic assembly is all about so in bi-direction sequencing single reads are the sequence from either forward or the, the reverse primer so these sequence need to be assembled pairwise so assembly is nothing but pairwise aligned pairwise means only two sequences forward and reverse right so through the overlapping region so if there is no overlapping region sequences cannot be assembled consensus sequence of the assembled sequence alignment is called quantic you know contig or contiguous sequence so contiguous sequence also known as contig is nothing but consensus sequence the final consensus so as you can see it here the component one component two and component three so we have got three uh, you know the amplicons or the product of the pcr and now we have got three single sequence reads so one and two there is overlap here right and now two and three there is another overlap so you can stitch it one then two then three to form the final sequence that is known as contiguous sequence as you can see in this figure so to assemble this contact first you have to know that which you know you have to identify which forms the contact for example 18 s is the locus forward and reverse from one template so you will have to identify which template and which primer pair so it's always better to do this exercise with the help of an excel file containing the assembly instruction for example template locus forward ab1 sequence and the reverse ab1 sequence id so ab1 is nothing but applied biosystems one of the famous makers of uh, sanger sequencer you know the capillary sequencer so usually the sequences usually have ab dot ab1 as a file extension so this sequence id with which locus and which template so if you make that excel it's much easier for uh, assembly so template is nothing but species it could be species one two three if you are doing a molecular systematic study or if you are doing a phylogeographic study then it is just always one species but different locations so in that case template could be location one location two etc so quantic assembly can be done with genius or codon code aligner there is another software called codon code aligner that can also be used for quantic assembly so in genius select contacts that need to be assembled and click d novo assembly or control alt and a that is a keyboard shortcut in the genius so genius is nothing but a, a, a you know a famous windows based graphical user interface software that used for this uh, sequence assembly contact construction and phylogenetic analysis which is not free of course it's a paid one but it's very popular and is very intuitive and very user friendly so as you can see this is an assembly right so to get this assembly you can do that with the uh, uh, de novo assembly option of this one so as you can see that if this assembly is actually consists of uh, 
four reads read one read two read three and read four together the software has constructed one consensus sequence here and ready for further using right so all these four sequences have been combined to form this consensus sequence so what is the fate of unassembled contact so unassembled sequences not all sequences form the contact contiguous sequence so unassembled sequences uh, can still be useful if it is of sufficient length and high quality so you will have to check that what is the sequence quality uh, you know if it is uh, this one is basically an assembly of two reads you can see it is 56 percentage is a quality which is not really good so optimally uh, the quality scores have to be more than 70 percentage right so if it is consensus is fine but if it is not consensus then you will have to check the quality uh, uh, gradings of the genius so for unassembled sequences it's always better to have a look at the hq percentage that is the quality of the sequence so if it is more than 60 or 70 percentage it might be well enough to use it but if it is less than 50 percentage i suggest you do not use that uh, sequence at all right so it is that looking at the hq percentage is a very good option to check the fate of the unassembled context so next up is trimming the ends so ends of the context can uh, it could be either primer binding sites or unamplified region which needs to be trimmed so trimming the contact is extremely important but many people miss that out and do the uh, sequence multiple sequence alignment and phylogenetic reconstruction without recognizing or realizing that the final tree is extremely fallacious because they uh, you know this they uh, overlooked that very important step of trimming the ends so to trim it either you can do that manually or you can right click on the assembly and choose trim ends. so that is automatic trimming inside the genius so just right click and then do this trim and so on uh, the genius will do this kind of track you know a pipe kind of track that is that means that all these sequences have been trimmed out because of the low quality so usually trim works uh, by looking at the quality as you can see here uh, the peaks are well defined well demarcated uh, all these areas are high quality right but this is not a high quality because this one is actually uh, pretty low quality you can see that it's actually going here and that's wavy wavy feature so all this needs to be removed but this one is okay right this is not removed so that is how to use this uh, uh, the trim ends feature of the genius so in this one you can see that this uh, low quality regions have automatically been trimmed out and it is not used for calculating the consensus sequence so because only from here onwards the consensus sequence exists but not from here onwards right so all these sequences have been removed by the automatic trim method so in summary in dna barcoding every single step counts initial steps like dna extraction and sequencing carry higher weights because mistakes in these crucial steps would have tremendous ramifications in later stages i will see you in next video